Hey, it's the analytics dude, back here with another Statistics Live video. This is the second coronavirus edition, aka the lockdown where everyone thinks they're an epidemiologist. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna pretend we're smarter than the epidemiologists and criticize their work. No, no, really, that's exactly what we're gonna do. I'm not an epidemiologist, and since they're not too common and you're watching this video, I'm guessing you aren't either. Uh, but there are two studies I wanna go over. I wanna show you how their methods were flawed and how the discussions of both led to inflammatory and extraordinary conclusions on one and a rather reasonable use of imperfect data on the other. The first study is one from Stanford University School of Medicine, where the lead author was quoted as saying, our findings suggest there is somewhere between 50 and 80 fold more infections in our county than what's known by the number of cases that are reported by our public department of health. That's the kind of extraordinary conclusion you don't often see from scientists. Let's see how it holds up. The researchers at Stanford had a test for COVID-19 antibodies, meaning they could test if someone had already been infected with COVID-19. The official count of COVID-19 infections is low. That's not a question. Not everyone can get tested who is sick and there's plenty of asymptomatic people. So the actual number of infections is always going to be higher than the official count of infections. How much higher? Who knows? Measuring that would be an admirable goal. The study tested 3,300 people for COVID-19 antibodies through drive through testing. How'd they find those participants, you may ask? Facebook ads. Oh, and also the wife of one of the lead authors recruited other parents from their kids' high school email lists. So as you can see, the respondents were self-selected and this is not a representative sample. Who's more likely to get tested under lockdown? If you were someone who thought you might have been exposed to COVID-19, would that make you more likely to go and get tested? Would the algorithm in Facebook, based on your experience, make it more likely or not that you'd even see this ad? What if you don't even use Facebook? Now, you can argue that those are going to be small differences, maybe one or two percent. But remember, small differences multiplied across large populations become large differences. Let's see how that worked out here. Of the 3,300 respondents, 50 tested positive. That's 1.5%. So a 1% or 2% difference in the 3300 sample can literally explain the entire effect that they saw. Next, the researchers adjusted for demographics. Remember that they got a portion of their sample from their kids' high school email list, so their sample was skewed toward rich white women. Based on other studies and actual testing, poor black and brown men were much more at risk of the infection. So based on their county demographics and those known data points, they adjusted their positive rate from 1.5% to 2.8%. Yes, you heard that right. Because they picked a crappy sample to start with, they nearly doubled their total of positive results. No test is right 100% of the time, and the way that they measured this is with sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity is the percentage of the time it correctly tests positive, and specificity is the percentage of the time it gives a false positive. Based on their test sensitivity and specificity, they further adjusted their range from 2.49% up to a top range of 4.16%. The top of that range at 4.16% is almost three times the 1.5% positive test they actually observed. It seems like a big jump, perhaps unreasonable, but here's the damning part. The specificity of their test had a range from 98.3% accurate to 99.9% accurate. That means that up to 1.7% of the tests could be false positives. That's more than the 1.5% of actual positives they observed, so the result was bounded by zero. It's conceivable that all of their positives were false positives. When you look at this as a whole, you wonder how someone can come to the conclusions that the true number of infections is 50 to 85 times the number reported. That could actually have been true, but it's hard to conclude that based off of this. Well, unless you consider that three of the study's main authors have been on the record multiple times saying that the pandemic was overblown, that the true fatality rate was no worse than the flu. Well, if you have a higher number of infections and the same number of death rate, that means the fatality rate is lower, which in turn would mean that they were right. So in other words, they found exactly what they wanted to find. At the start of this video, I mentioned I'd be talking about two studies. Well, around the same time as the Stanford study, the state of New York conducted a survey in grocery stores and big box stores that estimated that 21% of New Yorkers were infected with COVID-19. Wow, 21%? That's over five times the result from the Stanford survey. 
Where's the controversy there? Well, there wasn't any. That's because New York was open and honest that the methods of data collection, going out into high risk areas like grocery stores and big box stores, was going to skew higher, it was going to be a higher risk sample than the overall population. It's still a useful data point to people studying the pandemic, its transmission and its effects, but it's not a public sensation. In fact, it received a fraction of the attention that the Stanford study did. The Stanford study is a great example of the need for openness and transparency in data. We know how shoddy their methodology and data were because, well, they shared it. And while this study may have been a farce, the quick reaction of the data literate to get the real story out is a victory for data-enabled decision-making everywhere. I hope you enjoyed this and it helped you understand the world around you. Expertise is important, and the best situation for human knowledge is for experts to collaborate with each other and comment on each other's work, and in some unfortunate circumstances, tear down each other's work because it's just not up to standards. Till next time, I'm the Analytics Dude. Thanks for watching.